Sonic the Hedgehog, with his extraordinary speed and quality of graphics, catapulted him into a gaming icon. The Sonic franchise is vast, with over 70 million games sold worldwide, bringing a huge number of games to its loyal fan base and introducing a variety of characters, including Miles, Tails, Prower, Knuckles, Dr. Eggman, Amy Rose, and many more. And the franchise is set to grow even more as this year sees Sonic return with his latest video game installment, Sonic Generations. In the late 1980s, Nintendo was the leader in both hardware and game sales, thanks largely to the Super Mario games and their NES games platform. I'd had conversations with Mr. Nakayama, the, the uh, CEO of the company, about, uh, about what needed to be done for Sega to compete in the United States marketplace. Nintendo completely dominated the industry. They had a share of market that was above 90 percent. Third-party game developers were all beholden to Nintendo. I mean, they, they owed Nintendo their livelihood. So it was very difficult to break into the marketplace back in, in that time period. Sega, despite recently launching the more powerful Genesis, still needed a stunning new game to really show what the system could do and attempt to readdress the balance. They made the decision that before this game, they would need a new mascot other than the current Alex Kidd. So a new character had to be developed. For some time, the management of Sega was aware that to compete with Nintendo, one of the things that would be necessary was their own strong character to compete with Mario. Sega really wanted to create its uh, Sega's Mickey Mouse, Sega's Mario. The view at that time was you needed a mascot, typically a platformer, that brought to life what the, um, if you will, the irreverence of your brand. So the company started to ask all employees to come up with ideas. One person who heard this rallying call was Naito Oshima. で、そこに、うん、中さん。中さんがちょうどプロジェクトが終わって、で、中さんに相談して、なんか一緒にゲーム作ってもらえませんかってお願いしたところ、心よく中さんがじゃあ一緒にやろうよって、中さんといろいろ
ゲームをちゃんとなんか力を入れて作ろうということで、まあ、その当時の中ではすごい期間も通常よりも長くともらえていいゲームを作れということで作れたというのがスタートになると思います。まあ、やはりソニックでの大きな違いっていうとそのまあ今までそれ,それまではまあマリオとかもそうなんですがこうブロック単位でこうゲームのこうマップが構成されているところをですねこう滑らかなこういうふうな形をまあすごく高速で駆け抜けるっていうところがまあ大きなチャレンジだと思います。でここは滑らかに動けるっていうところがまあ,ある程度目処がついたのでこの滑らかにできるなら回れるんじゃないかということを。まあ、思ってですね僕自身がでそこでこういう,こうループみたいなところのプログラムを作り上げてきて、まあ、ですけどこれを作ったらいいんですけどもものすごいこのここ高速でいくとですねループ回らずに突っ込んでいったりとかですねすごくここをきれいに回すのに苦労した覚えはありますあのソニックというキャラクターの絵をいろんな方に見てもらうとソニックはすごく子供子供のキャラクターでとなんかすごく可愛いキャラクターだというふうに思われたのででも私が思ってたソニックはもっと大人をイメージしてたの。With the Sonic the Hedgehog character reaching the final design stage, Sega of Japan felt they had the new mascot and game they were hoping for. The character and concept art was sent to Sega of America, who felt that Sonic needed some adjustments to make him more suitable for the Western market. I was asked to redesign Sonic from his backstory to his character so that he could actually work in terms of advertising and merchandising the comic book series and on TV. The Sonic team in Japan really hated. Sega of America's uh, redesign of uh, uh, Sonic. In the meeting, they absolutely did not come around. I mean, they created a beautiful character, and they didn't feel that we had any right to change that character, which is quite understandable. But、um, we were on a mission, and we were going to make Sonic happen in all the right ways possible. We really believed in the redesign of the character, and he needed to be the face of Sega. Worldwide. After the meeting, however, they really assessed the strength of the game, the strength of the platform, and they determined that the Sega Genesis and Sonic was actually going to be more successful in America and in Europe versus in Japan. And so, because of that, they decided that we needed to make the calls required to make this character successful. Sega of America marketing made it a little Uh, in a way, edgier and、uh, in a way a little more comical, humorous, and、uh, soften it. With the character and game design really taking shape for North American audiences, along with the original Sonic team design for the rest of the world, Sega felt the project needed an equally impressive soundtrack. To achieve this, they brought in composer and co founding member of Japanese pop sensation, Dreams Come True. Masiato Nakamura.、Uh, I didn't treat、uh, Sonic as a, a game, but a film. You know, of course, a graphic is great and very, it has a very strong story. So I thought, oh, this is a movie, film. So I wanted to create a movie music or film music. However, with the game still very much in early development, only static screenshots were available for Nakamura to use for his inspiration. So,、uh, Sonic staff explained to me, you know, it's gonna be like this, it's gonna be like this. And I started, you know,、uh, writing songs, but、uh, I will never know because that was a totally, totally new for me. So, it was a really tough job for me. So, just because you know, I wanted to treat、uh, Sonic the Hedgehog as a film,、uh, my inspiration comes from each graphic, you know, each stage. s So, if I can see a red color, so my music is gonna be like a you know, volcano stuff, or if I can see an Iceland, I wanted to create a kind of icy music. So, my inspiration com- came from visual or graphic. 
at the same time, uh, the Mega Drive system, the sound system is very limited. Maybe we could use four sound or at the same time. So it's it was really really tricky, you know. But that limitation, you know, uh, inspired me a lot. With the test versions of the game looking good, Sega were growing in confidence that Sonic the Hedgehog would be the game that could really give the Genesis the boost it needed by showing off the truly cutting-edge hardware the console had for the time. ま、when I saw a very, very early version of Sonic. Graphics were half done, just part of the first Green Hill Zone. And it looked interesting from a different distance because it was so bright. But once I got up closer to it, they started going and moving Sonic around, having him roll up into a ball and then start moving. And it was like I had never seen speed like that. <laughs> やろうって言って割と早くしていたりした瞬間があるので、その時の確かに気持ち悪くなったりはしましたね。なので、そういった意味ではこうスタートする瞬間だったりとか、その後の流れてるところとかの調整みたいなのは、その当時やった覚えが
To build a buzz about the upcoming Sonic, Sega had an idea for a more direct but high-risk marketing strategy. I believed in being very aggressive in marketing. I believed in taking Nintendo on head-on. So one of the challenges that we had when marketing Sonic is we wanted to go directly up against Mario and we wanted to do that in TV. Uh, we created very competitive TV ad Comparing Nintendo game and Sega game side by side with price tag attached to it. And we knew that the minute we would televise a commercial against Mario, that Nintendo would require that we pull the TV spot. Tom and the marketing team asked me, uh, do you think uh, this will be uh, acceptable to the Japan management? And uh, I scratched my head and thought about this and uh, uh, decided not to tell the Japan management until only a few days before we air. And in case they said, you can't air this, stop it, um, I was thinking to tell them that I tried to stop it, but I couldn't stop it in time. It was. Um I think pretty innovative on our part to throw pretty much all of our media dollars against that one night worth of TV. Sonic the Hedgehog, more action, more speed. Sega Genesis, it's a whole lot more for less. Sonic the Hedgehog was released in June 1991, and the reaction was remarkable. People had never seen a game like it before. So why did Sonic's creation resonate with the public in the way that it did? Sonic was appealing for a number of different reasons. First of all, he just has a beautiful simplicity to him. Clean lines, just a gorgeous set of colors, the blue and the red tennis shoes. But secondly, he really communicated the power of the game just by looking at him. When you see those red tennis shoes, you just assume he can run fast, and he did. And his spin attack made it appear as though nothing could defeat Sonic the Hedgehog. And then the attitude at the end was just kind of the perfect topping. 僕が初めてソニックを触ったのはジェネシス、えー、メガドライブの時ですけれども、ソニックザヘッジホックというオリジナルタイトルです。で、その時はそのゲームのスピード感とあとはやはり音楽が持つキャッチーさ、そこに惹かれました。I was really taken by the speed and the feel of the game, and Sonic the Hedgehog just felt. Terrific. It was easy to play,、uh, it felt good to play, and the speed was just remarkable. I'd never seen a character move that quickly across the screen, and it was like magic back in those days. He had an edge to him. He wasn't your laid back, soft,、uh, nice guy. He had a little bit of edginess to him and a little bit of、uh, smart assness to him, if you will. And I think that made him very appealing to、uh, kids and, and teens. <laughs> まあ、まず第一印象かっこいいと思ったんですねあの青いあんな小さな等身のキャラクターですけどもあれが動いてる姿を見てもう本当にかっこいいでこれが本当に家庭用ゲーム機なのかって驚いたぐらいあのすごい強い印象を受けましたセガ felt that Sonic was going to be a hit Tom Kalinske felt Sonic's surefire appeal presented Sega with an innovative opportunity The thing we had to do first and foremost was sell a lot of hardware, because otherwise, how are you going to sell a lot of software? If you don't get a lot of hardware out into the homes, you really had no chance of creating a marketplace with、uh, follow on software. Tom and I went to Japan and sat down in the big Sega Japan boardroom with over a table with perhaps 30 board members and other executives and explained our strategy. That is,、uh, we lower our price from $189 to $149 when Nintendo was offering the Super Nintendo at $199. And on top of that, we wanted to bundle、uh, our software, Sonic 1, and create the bundle pack、uh, for that $149 price point. And、uh, as Tom started to explain, I saw Nakayama san's face sort of turning white and getting angry, and uh, uh, he stood up and said, uh, uh, We make money from software because we don't make money really from hardware. So,、uh, why we give away the best software away? 
and he kicked the chair and literally ran to the door. Then I thought, well, that's the end of my career. And he turned at the door and he said, well, I hired you to build the company and take market share from Nintendo. And if this is what you think you have to do, go ahead and do it. So he supported our plan 100%. And uh, to, his, to his credit, I think, uh, to his great credit, because he could have easily said no. And, uh, and because of his uh, allowing us to do that, we then went on to really dramatically take share of market away from Nintendo in the next year. The concept of bundling in our industry, i.e. of putting in software with the hardware to drive accelerated sales rates or to forestall a price drop, um, is a time-honored tradition, if you will. What, what Tom Kalinske did in 1991 here with the Genesis, uh, by putting Sonic in there, a triple A AAA piece of software, kind of broke the mold, if you will, um, from what had previously happened where the um, less desirable software had been packaged in because it was cheaper and more effective to be able to push that through rather than give away what was seen to be high profit margin software. People were buying Sega consoles simply to play Sonic and with Sonic proving to be a huge success it was inevitable that a sequel should follow. When we completed Sonic 1, which was originally developed in Japan, we realized that the real battlefield against Nintendo is the United States. Therefore, we brought the team to Palo Alto, uh, California, and added some American resources and started to create Sonic game. And uh, that really made uh, much uh, better closer collaboration between the Sonic team and the U.S. marketing team. After Sonic 1, we wanted Sonic to continue to grow. We, we managed his career, much like you would manage the career of a famous actor. And so what was important is that, first of all, we grew Sonic's world, and we introduced a new character by the name of Tails, so Sonic had a friend. And then we also continued to flush out his Bibles and flush out his backstory. We were much more involved in Sonic 2, but that said, the Sonic team really did drive the design of Sonic 2 as well. Al Nelson and I were a part of making sure that the new characters that were designed fit within the entire world. But the game was definitely driven, conceived of, and developed by the Sonic team. And they did a beautiful job as well. With Sonic 2 ready for release, Sega devised an incredibly clever piece of marketing, turning Sonic into a worldwide media sensation, and yet again improving sales of the Genesis, thanks to the aptly named Sonic Tuesday. Sonic Tuesday was an industry first, and we're proud of it. It was one of the first uh, worldwide launches, if not the first worldwide launch. There was a whole lot of logistics involved in making sure that we had all the millions of Sonics delivered to every single retail outlet and making them hold it until Sonic Tuesday. I and mean, I remember talking with the president of some of the air freight companies we were using and, and they were pulling their hair out and helping us manage this process of air shipping to every retail store or, and, and truck shipping to every retail store in America to make sure the product all arrived at the same moment so that it could be at retail uh, that next morning. Never before for a home video game had we witnessed the worldwide scenes of people lining up outside shops in the driving rain to take advantage of midnight openings, which back then was a true first for the video game industry. Sonic Tuesday was responsible for a major step up for the video game industry, a new PR and marketing benchmark that other publishers had to follow. Sonic 1 and 2 had been incredible hits and were just being played and played by the ever-growing fan base. Everyone just seemed to love Sonic, and while Sonic's popularity continued to rise, Sega continued to produce and release further games to add to the franchise. Sonic fans were appearing everywhere, and with it a competitive streak, as fans were eager to prove who was the very best amongst their friends. Everything we did was with this, with this one goal in mind, to make Sonic a very, very strong brand, a preeminent brand in uh, the video game industry, and also for kids' products in general. I believe that it was the, the, the first time anybody dared put their lead product in with the hardware. It was the first time there was TV shows developed around the character. It was the first time there were Happy Meal promotions where we sold 50 million Happy Meals with Sonic uh, characters in it. I think it was the first time a character was in the Macy's Day Parade. 
you know, from a video game. So I think there were a lot of firsts that, uh, that we did. And certainly it was the first time anybody made fun of their main competitor in television advertising and kind of ridiculed their, their main competitor in television advertising. Then in 1998, Sonic's move into 3D was a big success thanks to Sonic Adventure on the Sega Dreamcast. So, this is the first time I've been in the history of the turning point of the Sonic Adventure. So, this is the first time I've been in the history of the Sonic Adventure. 3D になってで単にそれが 3D になるだけではなくてキャラクターとして初めて声を喋ってキャラクターが一体どんな気持ちでどういう目的で敵と戦うのかというそういうドラマ的な部分が初めてこうゲームの中に加わったのがソニックアドベンチャーでしてえまあ,あの喋らなかったメガドライブのソニックがこう初めてえキャラクターとしてこう皆さんにこう初めてえそのキャラクター性を伝えられた。This no longer really was purely Sonic on a tight rail going up and down across mountains and terrains. There was this magnificent world now that surrounded, because of the power of the hardware, that surrounded Sonic and his friends. やっぱり当時の16ビット機からまあドリームキャストの方の新しいハードでまあ展開する新しいゲームということでやっぱそのハードの性能が上がることでまあ表現できること自体もやっぱりすごく大きく飛躍するのでまあそれを見た目デザインの方でどう表現していくかっていうところでまあまあそのキャラクターの見た目の変化によるインパクトっていうのとまあそうですねえっと実際のその表現力がアップした部分で各キャラクターのアクション性をいかに大きくカメラが引いたり寄ったりした時でも見せることができるかっていうところがまあスムーズに行えるように調整しながら制作しました With Sonic's move into 3D a success, more titles followed it. The development team always challenged with the need to raise the benchmark of each game right the way through to recent titles such as Sonic Colors. ソニックカラーズで初のディレクターという、えー、大役をいただいて、まあ、どうやって、えー、お客様に喜んでいただけるような、えー、ソニックの新しいゲームを作っていこうかというふうに考えたんですけれども、えー、まあそうはいええー、っとうちのソニックチームはもうソニックを作るあの優秀なスタッフが揃っているので、えーまあ、私よりもソニックに対しては、えー、もうベテランぞろいと。のチームであるというところでソニックを作ること自体はもう基本的に、えー、スタッフのみんなに任せようというふうに私は考えましたそして私自身は、えっと、それを、えー、っとよりハイスピードアクションの特にアクション部分プラットフォームアクション部分にフォーカスしていくように全体をこう誘導していくような立ち回りをしようというふうに意識してまあ作っていこうというふうに、えー、考えてました。The music of Sonic still commands a steadily growing fan base that has been growing some truly wonderful music with contributing musicians that each brought their own style to the Sonic franchise. ソニックの長い歴史の中でいろんな楽曲がありましたでその中で好きな曲とか自信のある曲を一曲あげろって言われてもなかなかこれは難しい話でそうですねトータルで言ったらもう100曲以上は多分作ってはいると思うんですけれどもまあその中で好きなもの強いてあげれるならばソニックアドベンチャー2のテーマ曲の「リブアンドラーン」とあとはそのタイトルの中のステージ曲の一つだった「エスケープ・フロム・ザ・シティ」という曲ですね。で他の方、まあ、例えば
オリジナルのソニックの楽曲を担当されていた中村さんの曲で言えば、えー、僕はソニック2の「エメラルドヒル」というステージの曲が好きです。Uh, of course, you know, the, the project of Sonic 2 is based on the Sonic 1's experience. Of course. But you know,、uh, te- technically, it was improved, you know, including sound itself. Audience expected more, you know what I mean? Because you know, Sonic One, it's got a、uh, you know,、uh, huge success. So I don't want to make you know, people disappointed, you know, Sonic Two. So it was huge pressure for me. Sonic series, the Naka, the Korema, the Jibun, the Tanto, the Kyok, the Momoi, the Momoi. 入れがあるというか、まあ、一番力を入れて注いできて力を入れてまあ作ってきたのがまあ各タイトルごとのテーマ曲だったりしますでやっぱりどの作品でも一番そのテーマとなるものが一番その作品の核となるものを表しているのでソニックのタイトルの、えー、楽曲を制作して今まで一番、えー、楽しかったなと思う、えー、思い出はですね、えー、ソニックアドベンチャーの楽曲制作になりますあそこで、えー、録音の楽しさっていうのを知,ったし、えー、知りましたし、えー、世界中のプレイヤーのこのなんて言うんでしょうクオリティの高さというのをもうまざまざと肌に感じた初めてのタイトルでしたので今ある僕の生活スタイルっていうのもあのタイトルでなんか確立されたんじゃないかなと思っていますそれぐらい僕の中では大きいタイトルになっています。To help celebrate his 20th birthday, Sonic is set to return in the game Sonic Generations, a game that embraces key eras in Sonic's remarkable 20 year history. Sonic Generations is a very important part of the game. In the 2D classic stage, the game is a very important part of the game. In the PS3 and 360, it is a 3D part of the game. えー、密度の濃い、えー、世界観となって新たに、えー、そのステージを再現するというところが一つのこのゲームのコンセプトとしてありまして、えーまあ、クラシックのステージはより、えー、密度の高い 3D のステージに逆に、えー、今度スリ元が 3D だった、えー、ステージ、まあ、あのソニック・アドベンチャー2のシティ・エスケープですとかそういう元が 3D だったステージを今度はクラシックで遊ぶと 2D のプラットフォームアクションとして遊べるというその、えー、最近の 2D のアクションと 3D のアクションの両方楽しめるというところが、えー、ソニックジェネーセンの一つの特徴ですねこのゲーム始めるときに私がチームに行ったことが20周年だからってあのー、さあ20周年集めましたよっていうようなタイトルにするのではなくて20周年だからこそ5年後の記憶に残るそういったゲームを作ろうとなので新しいチャレンジっていうのは今までのゲーム組み立てもちろんあるんですけどもそこに新しいギミックであったりとか今までなかった演出を追加してで、えー、今まで買ってもらったお客さんはもちろんで今までソニックをプレイしてなかったお客さんもあやっぱソニックって面白いんだって納得してもらえてそれで新しいその5年後につながるようなそういうゲームを作りたいなと思っていますそういうような、えー、今までの20周年の集まりっていうわけではなくてそれを超えた新しいチャレンジっていうのをこのゲームには詰め込んでいます。It's incredible to think now that we're in our 20th year of enjoying Sonic、uh, the Hedgehog games.、Um, there are very few characters or pieces of intellectual property, quite frankly, that can survive five or six years after sequels, never mind two decades. And it, I think it's a test to the timelessness, to the brilliance of the gameplay, to the richness of the world that is Sonic the Hedgehog and all of his friends, and the fact that he has seamlessly transitioned from platform to platform to platform. And never lost that edge, never lost the uniqueness of the gameplay, 
never lost that cheeky irreverent feeling that we all get when we play Sonic and I think uh, it's very rare that you can look in our industry today for a character that's withstood the test of time as has Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah.